Our next speaker is Dr. Daniel First. <clears throat> Dr. First is presently a professor of rheumatology emeritus at the University of California, Los Angeles. He's an adju adjunct clinical professor of rheumatology at the University of Washington in Seattle and a professor of rheumatology at the University of Florence in Florence, Italy. He has two part-time practices, one in Los Angeles and one in Seattle, where he concentrates on patients with difficult to treat rheumatoid arthritis and in the, in the, the treatment of systemic sclerosis, as well as more general rheumatology. Dr. First's interests, research interests, excuse me, center on the clinical pharmacology of anti-rheumatic drugs and biologics and on the pathophysiology and treatment of progressive systemic sclerosis. He's the former president and current vice president and board member of the Southern California chapter of the Scleroderma Foundation and a member of the Scleroderma Foundation's Medical and Scientific Advisory Board and on the board of directors for the Foundation of the Collaboration of Research Rheumatologists of North America. He is on the editorial review board of numerous clinical, pharmacolo clinical pharmacology and rheumatic disease journals. He has written over 950 original articles, reviews, chapters of books, and written or edited 17 books on rheumatic diseases, including a book on scleroderma. Please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Daniel First. There we go. Sorry, I had my mute on. It's a real yeah, pleasure to be here amongst you. And I want to say particularly hello to John Wu, who apparently is with us. It's good to see your name here. Um, obviously, we are honoring uh, Cherry Wu, and both Elaine and I knew her and thought the world of her. So it's a true honor to be part of such a conference. Let me share my screen. What I'm going to talk to you all about is what amounts to the real progress that's been made in treating systemic sclerosis. I have disclosures. I work with numerous companies uh, in order to get my research done. And what I want to talk to you about is four things. One, an immunological prim primer. Two, some of the work that was done early on, and then the later therapy. And that will require a short side trip into genetics. Those of you who've heard my lectures before know that I uh, structured around the pathogenesis of systemic sclerosis. And that involves genetics. It involves environmental effects and the three basic nodes, immune activation, vascular damage, and fibroblast proliferation. The latter resulting in collagen, which we see as scleroderma. And by the way, I just got a little notification that my um, internet is unstable. So if suddenly I disappear, hang in there. I'm not going to cover the vascular aspects of the disease. The treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension, one of the vascular aspects is really a separate lecture. There's so much that's been done. You can see here that there've been more than 10 different treatments for PAH and combination therapy as well. So that's really more than we can cover. In addition, I'm not going to try and cover the therapy of Raynaud's phenomenon for which there are an additional nine different therapies. But I want to talk about immunology a little bit and get everybody on the same page. And this is the page. It's a game, it's called whack-a-mole. And the immune system is very much like whack-a-mole. You knock down part of it and something else will pop up. And each of us has our own whack-a-mole game immune system. And there are multiple different whack-a-mole games representing all the different things and immune systems each of us has. One of the major players in our immune system 
are B cells. It's kind of a lymphocyte. And what you see here, all those things sticking out are receptors into the cell. In addition, there are T cells, a different kind of lymphocyte. And you can see it also has those receptors sticking out and it is connected to an antigen presenting cell, a kind of cell we'll talk about a little bit more later. What happens is those antigen presenting cells see foreign proteins, take them in, process them, and then present them in this case to a, a T cell, which becomes activated. That T cell interacts with the B cell. And they talk back and forth, one of them releasing antibodies, the other releasing cytokines. And these are proteins which turn on and turn off and regulate the immune system. And this, this triumvirate interacts to cause overactivity. How does it do it? Well, it gets pretty complicated at the cellular level. Here are examples of some of the receptors on the main cells we talked about, B cells and antigen presenting cells, and there are various kinds of T cells, et cetera. The point of this slide is to point out that really there are a lot of different aspects and connections. And those connections, when they turn on cells, if you look carefully, you'll see down in the right-hand corner, TNF and IL-1 and IL-17. And those are proteins which we can attack to try and turn some of these cells off. And then in the middle, you see the TNF and you also see something called TGF-beta. We'll talk about that. And IL-10, which is a different protein, which actually turns down the immune system. And then the left corner, you see IL-6, again, another protein about which we will talk. So these cells interact, they release proteins, the proteins are active, the interactions turn on and turn off cells. And so you get the immune system simplified as you see it here. What I'm going to talk about are two aspects, as I mentioned before, the immune activation and the fibroblast proliferation of the nodes of the pathogenesis of scleroderma. In the 70s and 80s and 90s, there were a number of different medications that were tried, and you see a list of most of them here. I'm only going to talk about two of them, D-penicillamine and methotrexate. You will notice that there are a number of others about which I'm not going to speak. And you'll also notice that the, the well-done trial started in around the 1970s when we did one of the first ones. This is the study of D-penicillamine. And there are a couple of things I want you to notice. First of all, there were two doses, a very low dose, didn't have any effects, and a high dose, which is a standard effect. Second, you'll see that there are only about 30, 35 patients per group. And when you look at the graph, what you see is the improvement in the SKHSC. That's the skin score or the modified Rodman score. And the low dose seemed to have more of an effect than the high dose, but it wasn't statistically significant. You can see that the p-value was 0.16, and the magic number is 0.05. So when something is 0.05 or less, it's statistically significant. So the chances are pretty good that it actually worked. The other drug is methotrexate. And what this shows is if you look at the responses to methotrexate, that there's a 90.4% probability that the skin, the MRSS, will respond. That's pretty good. It shows that methotrexate can work on the skin. Unfortunately, it, uh, it did not work on the lungs or the GI tract or any of the other organs, except the joints in which it also works. 
But once we got into the 2000s, a whole bunch more of treatments started. And you'll see in purple the ones we're going to talk about, but you'll also see in black the ones we're not going to talk about. And you'll notice that most of them were in the 2000s and really much more in the 2010s, the last 10 years or so. What's that mean? Well, overall, as we learned more about the pathogenesis of scleroderma and learned more about the genetics of scleroderma, we could get more targeted about how we treated the patient, you all. And we also learned more about how to do the trials better. And you'll see that now for the first time in the last two years, we now have two drugs that are approved for scleroderma and another treatment that in essence is also approved. Let's first talk about cyclophosphate. Cyclophosphamide is a drug that affects both B and T cells. And in this trial, which was a double blind trial versus placebo, yellow was placebo, red was cyclophosphamide. This looks at the forced vital capacity. That's a test of how well you breathe in and out. A couple of things here. First of all, you'll notice that for the first three months, there really was no difference between the two because cyclophosphamide takes some time to kick in. And then the trial was 12 months long and then patients were followed for another year. And you'll notice that the cyclophosphamide continued to improve the lung for about six months after it was stopped because it was stopped in one year. So there's a carryover effect. Just like it takes a little time to get started, it also carries over and continues to work for some time after it's stopped. Oral uh, cyclophosphamide works to stabilize the lung and it improves the skin, although I didn't show you that, in scleroderma patients with lung involvement. What about mycophenolate or mycophenolate mofetil? That's uh, I'm sure many of you may know it. This is another drug that affects both B and T cells. And there was a trial that we did which compared cyclophosphamide to mycophenolate. And what you see here is that in this trial, the mycophenolate was done for two years, the cyclophosphamide for one year, and then a placebo replaced it. And you can see once more the, the solid line that after 12 months, the cyclophosphamide stopped, but it continued to improve. And here you see that it actually did improve, not just stabilize. And the same thing was true for mycophenolate, the dotted line. And you see they were totally equivalent. This is a different way of presenting it. This looked at survival. And you can see that the variability, that's the red and blue, overlap completely. And there was no difference in the survival between the two drugs. Well, what about side effects? If you look at them over here, the two right columns, you see that SAE, that's serious adverse events, were about the same. If you look at the serious adverse events due to drug, it looked like cyclophosphamide occurred more frequently. There was no statistical difference. On the other hand, if you look at, at serious adverse events due to other causes, not the scleroderma, not the drug, it was more common in the mycophenolate group. Again, not statistically different. So there was no difference statistically between these two. But if you look at some of the details, you'll see and the lighter color was the cyclophosphamide, the darker color was the mycophenolate, that in two particular cases, there was a difference. One, in, the, in weight, that's generally kind of a feeling of feeling sick and nasty. The, there was more, and it was statistically more, in the cyclophosphamide group. And the other thing was that the white count went down. 
more in the cyclophosphamide group than the mycophenolate group. There weren't more infections, but the white count went down. So if you think about CELCEP, it works as well as oral cyclophosphamide with maybe fewer side effects. And that's part of the reason it's kind of become the standard drug for treating scleroderma. What about lenabacin? Very interesting drug. For that, we have to take one quick sidestep. There are two parts of our immune system. One is called the innate system and the other adaptive. The innate is a much earlier system, much more primitive animals have it. And basically what it does is it responds rapidly and it responds to infections of all sorts. The adaptive immune system, after being um, programmed by the innate system, is much more specific. So instead of bacteria, it'll be each type of bacteria. And that's the one we talked about before. But there are basically two of them. And linobasum kind of separates them. What it does is it tends to resolve the overactive in, um, um, innate system, but keep the other one active. And the result of that interaction is decreased inflammation, increased death, apoptosis of inflammatory cells, increased bacterial clearance, decreased fibrosis, decreased collagen production. So lenobasum is really just the drug you might want. It's a cannabinoid. So everybody says, oh my God, I'm going to be hooked. It actually is not um, uh, addicting. And it affects one of the two main uh, receptors on the cannabinoid family. In the first study, using a combined measure called the CRIS, you can see that the drug at that time called JBT was much more effective than placebo. And it was statistically significant, even though it was only 15 patients per group. However, when the large trial was done, and it was just finished in September of last year, and it was in 365 patients, the CRIS, that combined measure, did not separate placebo from lenabasin. Why? Well, it turns out that the CELCEP was unusually effective in this trial. Most of the time in trials, the mycophenolate affects and improves about 60% of people. Here, it improved 88% of people. The result of that was that the lenabasin couldn't do better. How can you do better than perfect? I mean, 90% of the people basically improved on the mycophenolate. So it could not be shown to work, possibly because the mycophenolate worked so well. However, this mechanism of action needs to be investigated further. And in fact, we're starting another trial with a different company using a different kind of drug in the cannabinoid family that we hope will do the job. Linobasum had a tremendous amount of hope. It still does. It won't work for this disease. And in fact, I'm afraid the, pay, the whole drug company may founder on this, but we shouldn't give up on the mechanism. What about rituximab or rituxin? Rituxin affects the B cell. What it does is it kills the B cell in one stage. And B cells interact with T cells, as we said, Four, they turn on various antibodies, they turn on inflammatory cells. When, so when you get rid of the B cells, all those things turn down. And there were some open studies here, two of them. These were in very small number of patients. You can see that it was what, seven patients. Uh, in, and what you see is the FVC and the DLCO, those are two measures of the lung tended to get better, while the MRSS, the skin on the right, tend to get lower, which is better. So it really looked very encouraging. 
And there was a drug called belimumab, which is also a B cell drug. It's been used in lupus a lot, which in this very small study, each dot represents one person. So you can see how few people they were. And it really looked like in this very small study as if it would work. So the NIH supported a, a study looking at rituximab for pulmonary hypertension. Unfortunately, that trial failed. And so we're now in a position where the mechanism of action, the B cell effect should be affected, but so far the studies haven't been very useful. It is being used, but we better get some more better studies done before it can be approved. What about stem cell transplantation? I'm sure you've heard a good deal about it. So I won't spend too much time on it, but I will spend some time because it is one of the three therapies that is effective. What happens is on the left, we give some medications which turns on the bone marrow to produce a whole bunch of very early cells, immune cells. And then on the right, they're taken off the body with kind of a filter sort of like dialysis. Then those cells are separated and the patient is given drugs that kill the immune system. Thereafter, those cells that were taken off are put back in the patient and the patient reconstitutes his or her immune system so that the immune system grows up seeing scleroderma as normal. So it doesn't react to it. And so the person can heal. This is a patient with scleroderma. On the left, when she was active, then she had a transplant. On the right, she's Indian, so that's her normal color. And you can see, obviously, that the skin really improved. And here's another patient, one of my patients. And over time, you can see that his skin improved very well as well. And when biopsies were done, it really looked very, very encouraging. At the top is a patient early on in scleroderma, and that big purple area is how thick on the right you can see <clears throat> that that basically is all fibrosis. Then one year it looks less thick. There's still a lot of fibrosis, but it's beginning to look more normal. And then at five years, it's completely normal skin. And the fibrosis is completely normal. It actually cured the skin. And if you look at survival, look at overall survival on the right, compared to IV cyclophosphamide, which we know is an effective treatment, this transplant was significantly better. You can see here the p-value was 0 0.019, much better than that 0.05 I mentioned to you before. So it really helped overall survival as well as these other things. Stem cell transplantation has been shown to be effective, but you never get something for nothing. And the toxicity of this, approximately a three to 5% death rate from treatment, makes it only appropriate for really rapidly progressive severe disease. What about tocilizumab? Tocilizumab is an antibody and it attaches to the receptors on cells as you see here. And then when IL-6, which is a protein which turns on all sorts of inflammation, tries to attach, it can't. And so instead of being turned on by the IL-6, the tocilizumab, the anti-IL-6, prevents the cells from being turned on. And so the disease calms down. In the first trial, a phase two trial, looking at the skin, and you see that here, you can see that the tocilizumab tended to improve the skin while the placebo group stayed the same. You see the p-value was 
on the right-hand corner, 0 0.06. So it didn't quite separate, but this was an 80 patient trial. But what was found in that trial was that if you looked at the, um, at the FVC, the lung, the patients on posalizumab stayed stable, whereas the lung in the placebo group tended to get worse, statistically so. And those patients who had lung disease, even better stayed stable and actually improved. And what's happened is, and this has never happened before, the same studies were, were taken down to the FDA and were presented in terms of the lung rather than the skin which didn't improve, and it was approved so that in the last two weeks, tocilizumab was approved to treat the lung in ILD. Remarkable. This is the newest drug to be approved. It may well be effective for the skin as well, and certainly the joints, because it's approved for the joints and rheumatoid arthritis. This is really an optimistic sign. So we now, at this point, have talked about two treatments that seem to work. Stem cell, which even though it's not approved, is being approved by insurance because the data is really pretty strong. And now tocilizumab, which is approved, and so the insurance companies cannot turn it down. There was another drug that was tried, abacacet. And what this drug did is it interfered with the interaction between those antigen presenting cells and the T cells, so the T cells never got turned on. When it was looked at in this study of about 88 patients, the skin did not separate placebo from drug. So it was a failed trial in that way. But in some ways it did improve. The MD Global improved for drug versus placebo function, the hack DI. And many of you, you those of you particularly who are patients of mine, do the hack DI all the time. Both of those improved. So now a short trip into genetics because I, what I'm going to tell you now, I think is the wave of the future. You all know about the chromosomes and the genes and the, each chromosome has multiple genes on it. In scleroderma, this particular set of genes is particularly important. And it turns out that there are a number of genes that are, that are associated with some of the antibodies that are important in scleroderma. Anti-centimere, the um, anti-toposomerase or SCL70 are associated with different specific genes. And those make a difference because it turns out that if a patient has anti-centromere, and this is more common in Caucasians and Chinese, they do better. And if they have toposomerase, more common in African-Americans and the Chinese, they have a more severe disease. And if they have RNA polymerase three, which is more common in Caucasians and African-Americans, they have a different set of problems. So that it turns out that the genetics, which affect the antibodies, tell us something about the disease. This is a bit complicated, but really is important. Each column is a different cell, a, a different patient. And each column goes all the way down. You can't separate columns here, of course. This is hundreds of patients. And what you see is in red, genes that are turned on. In green, genes that are turned off. And it turns out that there are different signatures of some of these genes. Some of the genes that are in proliferative are more common in some patients and those which are inflammatory are more common in others. 
And there are some whose genes look like normals. Well, so what? This is so what? In the Abitasep study, about 40% of the patients had inflammatory signatures and 40% were normal-ish and 21 had the fiber proliferative. Now let's look at the top and look carefully here because you have to really pay attention. What you see at the top are purple dots. Those purple dots are the placebo patients in the um, inflammatory group. And now look at the purple solid line. And you see that the solid line improved. So even though the study was negative, when you broke the patients into the groupings of inflammatory, proliferative, and normal, those with the inflammatory signature got better, whereas the others did not. And then when you look at the middle one, where they talk about the lungs, there, the red, that's the fibroproliferative group. The solid line got better. The dotted line got worse. That's the placebo group. So the lung in the fibroproliferative group got better. So you see a very important point that even though the trial was negative, it points to the way of the future for treatment of scleroderma. We're not quite there yet, but the genetic signature seems to predict who will respond to what kind of patient, uh, what kind of medication. So we're certainly going to have to do more research, but I believe this is where we're going in the future. Now, what about Nintendo? Nintendib is the only drug of the ones we talked about that works only in the fibroblast proliferation area. And in, 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 in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, a disease similar to but not scleroderma, you can see that Nintendib um, prevented worsening of the lung compared to placebo. The amount was very small, but it was statistical. And there was a very large trial, a global trial in scleroderma. And you can see the number of patients of about 580 patients, huge number of patients. And statistically, the Nintendib group resulted in improvement by a very small amount, but statistical compared to placebo. And when it was looked at in the way that you see here, it showed the same thing. So the green showed improvement, and this was improvement by a small amount, but a, a, a clinically important amount, and there was no difference. And then if you look at the stable group, there was no difference. But if you look at the worsening group, the placebo patients, there were more placebo patients that got worse than in the nintendib group. And that was statistically significant. So it looks like nintendib is, stabilizes the, the, the lungs. Didn't affect anything else, but it stabilized the lungs and it was approved for use. Of course, you never get something for nothing. Here's what you see. Let's look at the autoimmune ILD in the right two columns. Diarrhea was way more common, 63 versus 27%. Nausea, nearly three times as common. Vomiting, two times as common. Decreased appetite, nearly 15 times as common. Liver function test abnormality, five times as common. Weight decrease, that may not be a bad thing, 10 times common. So there certainly are lots of side effects. But it's the first antifibrotic drug approved for scleroderma. Very small efficacy, significant GI side effects, but it may be a reasonable add on to other medications. So, for example, Celsep plus Nintendo. 
in people with significant lung disease. So what we've gone over is the difference between early therapies you see here, and we talked about the penicillamine and methotrexate, and the many new therapies based on a better understanding of genetics, better understanding of the immune system that have come up, among which we now have three, well, two and a half approved therapies, nintedinib, tocilizumab, and stem cell therapy. So we're really getting to the point where we can truly say that scleroderma is a treatable disease. This is Paul Clay, he had scleroderma. And with that, I wanted to thank you. And, and um, again, thank you for the honor of allowing us to contribute to Cherry Wu's uh, day uh, of education. Thanks. Are there any questions? Can you help me uh, uh, pass them on? And they'll probably be in the chat or something. Sure, yeah, there's sort. a bunch of questions in the chat here. Do you want me to just read some? Yes, why don't you do that? Okay, let me scroll up real quick. So what was near the top here? <laughs> oh, oh, it's just scrolling, okay. Well, I might not be able to get to the top because it keeps scrolling. Um, someone's asking, what are the side effects with tocilizumab? So you've heard me say a multiple times, you never get something for nothing. And so you have to think about side effects. So like any um, biologic that decreases the immune system, there's an increased possibility of infections, not viral ones. And you know, as a matter of fact, that tocilizumab is being used for severe COVID. So it's not viral, but bacterial infections. The other thing it does, and so we have to watch the cholesterol and sometimes even have to treat the cholesterol. And then any drug can cause rashes or can cause <coughs> liver or white cell changes. So we have to get blood tests on a regular basis. But if we do that, it's a pretty safe drug. It's been used in rheumatoid arthritis for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. So we have plenty of experience with it and we kind of know how to deal with it. Uh, and then I think sort of similar to that, any comment on long-term effects for cell sept or mycophenolate? Very good question. One of the reasons that we were a little bit concerned about using cyclophosphamide for the long haul is that although it did look pretty good over two years, there are some data that there are increased bladder cancers five or six years later. For mycophenolate, that has not been shown. The incidence of cancers is not particularly increased. Um, there are some minor worries about the liver but overall, because of that long-term difference between cyclophosphamide and mycophenolate, and our belief, and, and mycophenolate, by the way, has been used long-term in um, renal transplant. So we have some feel for the long-term. And it looks like long-term, it's really safer. There isn't this cancer problem. Someone wants to know, what was the name of the med that you said was just approved two weeks ago? I'm sorry, I lost you I on that. I think I lost you Go for on. a second. <laughs> uh, so read it, read it again. They're wanting to know more about uh, what, what's the medicine that you said was approved just two weeks ago? That's tocilizumab. That's um, The other one that was approved about a year ago is nintedinib. Um, and that's the one where there's a very small change, probably going to end up being used added on to the other therapies. Can any of the technologies that created the new COVID vaccines be transferred to scleroderma treatments? That question's from John Wu. Okay, great question, John. Um, 
I hope you're doing well, by the way. Um, you know, for rheumatoid arthritis, various individuals have tried to vaccinate against the disease. And so in, in theory, vaccination technology may be able to be used. It has not been tested in scleroderma, but your concept is excellent. The issue is that in scleroderma, we have so many different genes and proteins, it's hard to aim at a particular single protein that's gonna change the disease. I will say that in my mind, TGF beta, one of those that in fact failed a very early trial, if we could vaccinate against the genes that prevent, that, that cause uh, an overproduction in particular cells in scleroderma, we might be able to do something. It would be a combination of a vaccination plus a delivery system that is specific for particular cells like lung cells. So it, you can see that it's, it's in the future, but it's not impossible. Here's another one. <clears throat> Excuse me. How much better is nintendinib versus myofortic? So myofortic is a form of cell set. Um, so it has the same um, efficacy as mycophenolate or cell set. Nintendinib is just barely effective. I'll give you a handle on this. Normal patients. As we age, we lose 40 mils, that's 40 milliliters, very small amount of lung um, activity. Every year we breathe in and out 40 mils later, uh, 40 mils less. The nintendinib in the study prevented 100 mils. If you look at mycophenolate in the lung, you get 1,500 mils. So if you think about it that way, it's about a tenth or less as effective as the mycophenolate. It's not a very good way to look at it. Why? Because the mechanisms are so different so that actually you can add the two together. Different mechanisms on the same disease may help in combination. So even though I use it very rarely because most of my patients have tried it, they've had diarrhea, who just couldn't get it controlled no matter what I did. But in those few patients in whom one can do it, it might be possible to use the two together. But certainly nintendinib is nowhere near as effective as myofortic or celsa. Um. How likely is it that if I have scleroderma that my children will have it? Is there any statistics? Yeah, there actually are. There is a genetic possibility. What happens is patients with scleroderma have family who tend to have more thyroid problems, but not really less than 1% probability that uh, an offspring of someone with scleroderma is going to get anything like anything in the family of scleroderma. The thyroid, yes, but really not otherwise. What is more likely, and, and, and this is being shown very, very slowly, is that on a genetic background, there could be certain environmental effects that could kick off the scleroderma. So there are some areas, believe it or not, around Boston. There are some um, coal mines in South Africa. There are certain forests in Scandinavia, which are associated with more scleroderma. But if you think about your own child, the probability is less than 1%. 
Okay, the next question is, my husband was on Celsept after methotrexate and the doctor took him off after only two months saying it wasn't working and he's now on cyclo, I think that's supposed to be cyclophosphamide. Was it too soon to switch? So I missed about two thirds of it. Oh, it said, sorry. my husband was on mycophenolate and then I lost you. Yeah, my, my husband was on Celsept after methotrexate and the doctor took him off after only two months saying that it wasn't working and he's now on cyclophosphamide. Was it too soon to switch? In most of my patients, I wait three to six months before switching. And the reason I do that is this long-term toxicity issue. That is the cyclophosphamide, particularly if given IV, may be slightly more effective, but I always worry about the side effects. So it may be that your doctor is considering using cyclophosphamide for let's say six months or so, getting maybe a better response and then switching back. But personally, I wait three to six months before I will um, stop the mycophenolate for inefficacy. The next one is, at what point do you think stem 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 cell procedure can be discussed? So I'm sorry, for this particular person or uh, uh, it's general? a different It's a different person. That's just the next question. At what point do you think stem cell procedure can uh, be discussed? Okay, great. Very good question. When you have someone who's really done very badly for a long time, where the lungs just aren't functioning anymore. Using stem cell will not turn that around. By the way, for people like that, and I didn't talk about this much, but uh, lung transplants are being used more and more in people whose lungs are really terrible, whereas the rest of them is reasonably good. But anyway, for the patient who has an end stage lung or kidney or GI tract, the use of stem cell really won't turn it around. The best time is to get someone who is early in their disease, first few years, whose skin may be pretty bad, whose lungs are inflamed, and there's some effect, but they're pretty good. And that's the best patient to use uh, stem cell for. It amounts to about 10 or 15 percent of, of scleroderma patients. But um, when I see a patient like that, I tend to say, all right, we'll try one thing, three, four months. If things are not going in the right direction, they've got very active disease, their lungs are not doing well, their skin looks like it's very active, I will go right away to stem cell, even though it's dangerous, because those kind of patients have been shown to have a very high mortality in five years. I'm going to skip a question and go back to it because the next one after that is kind of relevant to what we we're just talking about. They're asking, would you recommend trying some of these new therapies versus consider considering the stem cell transplant? So at this point, if a patient comes in to me very early, I will immediately put them on either mycophenolate or tocilizumab and see what happens in three, four months and then make a decision. Many of these patients initially get a little worse because it takes time for that drug to kick in, but then they begin to flatten out, flatten out meaning getting better. And so in that point, when a person looks like they're getting better, I give them another three or four months. And why? Because even though stem cell is very good, remember that three to 5% of patients can die from the procedure. You know, that's, that's low, but it's not vanishingly low. And so if we can see the other drug beginning to work, I like to give it a little more time in the hopes that we don't need to go to stem cell. We still have some time to go to stem cell. Um, most of our patients uh, that go to stem cell have had the disease for three to five years. 
Um, this one is my husband, after having scleroderma for five to 10 years, developed AITL, angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma. He worries about drugs that might impact the immune system. Oh, he worries about drugs that impact the immune system that may impact the lymphoma. Is there likely to be a danger with this? Yes, there is, but there's a wonderful drug that may do just what he needs, which is rituximab because the rituximab has been used for lymphomas and is being used for, as I told you, for uh, scleroderma and is not associated with the induction of lymphomas or cancers. Cool. Uh, one thing we're getting a lot of in the chat that I don't know if you want to address or not, everyone's asking about the COVID vaccine and the effects on scleroderma patients. And there's a couple of different really specific questions. Um, someone is asking if you could explain the B and T cell reactivity and other mechanisms in the scleroderma patients and how that interacts with the COVID vaccines or vice versa. Okay. And I think these are very good questions. In fact, uh, just so you know, I am developing a lecture on this, which I think I gave to some patients, but are now it needs, you know, when I gave the lecture on it, I told them that by the end of the lecture, there'll be new data. Um, it, it's remarkable. There have been 55,000 articles on COVID. Remarkable. But what about the vaccine? So, as you know, there are basically three vaccines that are available. Two of them are mRNA vaccine, and one is a um, a virus that has been inactivated. The two mRNA vaccines are very effective. Um, about and you might ask several questions. One, if a person has scleroderma and they get the vaccine, is their disease going to flare? So far, we don't have too much data in um, co in, in SARS-CoV-2, that is COVID-19, but when we look at other, disease, uh, other vaccinations, they do not cause flare of the disease. So I have very little concern that the vaccine will flare the disease. It works differently than in the immune system because it works directly on the um, on the virus and produces antibodies that are part of the adaptive immune system. Remember we talked about that? Those are the B and T cells that are very specific for the COVID-19, well, the SARS-CoV-2. And so it's not going to turn the disease on, okay? On the other hand, what about all the drugs we use that are immunosuppressive? We don't have, again, a lot of data on this, but there's a, a, a trial we're just trying to publish, which looks at 178 patients who got COVID. And they were uh, on all sorts of immunosuppressive drugs. And there did not appear to be an, uh, a decrease in reaction to the vaccine. But in a more general way, I think that you can say that patients who are immunosuppressed by drugs have a lower effective response. And the rate of lower response is 10 to 15%. So that if patients without disease have a 90% response, you'd expect an 80 or 75% response. Not quite as good, but pretty good. So people ask, well, wait, 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 then should I stop the immunosuppressives? for some time before getting the vaccine. And there has been some recommendations um, put out, but the data is very, very low quality. And although it's a group of experts who pretty much know what they're doing, it's kind of some guesses. So what their guess is that for some of the drugs, Abitacept, um, 
maybe, uh, um, come on, I'm just blanking, the TNFs, stop the drug for one week before or at least one week after the dose. So you get your dose, you wait for one week, and then you can give a dose. Now, that, that to me doesn't make much sense because in two or three weeks, you're getting the second dose. So what I would recommend without any real data is if you're worried, I'm not very worried, I might, might tell you, but if you're particularly worried, then stop it a, a, a week before you get the dose and then start again one week or maximum two weeks after the second dose. What's the danger? The danger is that your disease might flare. And for that reason, if you're using a drug which tends to not have a long delay before starting again, then I would not stop. But for example, cyclophosphamol, we have data that shows that after you've been on it for a while, it doesn't flare for three or four months after. Okay, perfect drug. Stop before, wait two weeks after, restart. What about a drug like methotrexate? A little bit of controversy there, but in most, in most cases, the, for example, if you're gonna have surgery and you don't stop the methotrexate, you don't get more infections. And so my feeling is, now the recommendations are stop for a week after each dose. My recommendation is because it's already in the cells, it stays in the cells, is that you don't need to stop. But in most cases, if you feel really a problem, stop for a week after each dose. Okay. All right. Uh, we're about out of time. Anyway, we need to go to break. They have one more question that I've seen a few more times that should be really quick. And that is, are you seeing new patients in Seattle? And if so, how can they get in to see you? Yeah, I am seeing new patients. You call um, Seattle Rheumatology Associates. Tell them that you saw me on this and that I need to get you in quickly and they'll figure out a way. Perfect. Thank you okay. so much, Dr. First. This was great. All right. Real pleasure. And thank you all for the honor. And um, you all should look forward to the next speaker who happens to be my wife. Take care.